I'm pretty sure that for most of us, if we went on the lam and didn't show up for work, we would be fired. That simple. That basic rule somehow doesn't seem to apply to certain Wisconsin lawmakers. Former vice presidential candidate and governor of Alaska, Sarah Palin, joins me now. Governor, should these lawmakers be fired? Yeah, they absolutely should be fired. They should be recalled. You know, they've retreated. It's not like they're reloading. They've retreated. They're not doing their job. And bless his heart, that Wisconsin governor is doing all that he can to allow his state to be solvent. And uh, he certainly isn't getting any help from the Democrats. Well, so as a former governor yourself, you can certainly understand what he's going through. If, if your legislators left the uh, legislature in Alaska, would you be hunting them down? You know, you do need to call them back and get them to be held accountable and have them do their job. I mean, what, what, what a deal this, this governor of Wisconsin is having to deal with this. In states, you know, we have, um, for most of us, constitutional mandates to balance our budgets, and we can't just go out and print more money. We have an obligation to live within our means, and that's what this governor is trying to do. Well, clearly, and, you know, I think the shame of it is that you've got all of these protesters who were in there for so long, and the tax is going to end up cleaning up the mess in the state capitol, but that's another issue. But as you say, when you talk about budgets, we've got a big issue now with the federal budget. And of course, there is a stance by the Tea Party, and I'm curious as to whether or not you agree with it, where they are literally willing to risk government shutdown if uh, their uh, compromise on the federal budget isn't met. What do, what do you think should happen here? Well, I think these independent Tea Party Americans are just full of common sense who know that, you know, the feds were only bringing in $2.2 trillion a year and yet we're spending $3.5 trillion a year. Something's got to give. We absolutely have got to cut the budget and we've got to reform entitlement programs and start living within our means. So these independent Tea Party Americans, I don't believe they, I'm certainly not, buying into all the rhetoric that we have to result in a government shutdown if we don't give, give, give and grow government and, and and not make these cuts because we bring in seven billion dollars a day if we took that seven billion dollars a day and fund the essentials and service our debt those things coming first as our highest priority then uh, th this whole budget discussion doesn't have to lead to a government shutdown I don't buy into all that rhetoric but but let me ask you this though if the government were to shut down what what would actually happen well, that's a good question. It's amazing that the budget gurus there in D.C. aren't telling the public what actually happens if some uh, delayed programs are going to be a result or if some bills don't necessarily get paid as quickly as they would get paid. I, you know, th th that's a question that uh, certainly a lot of us would like to know. What does this really entail, this quote-unquote right. government shutdown? But again, if priorities are made wisely and the dollars, the tax revenues coming in on a daily basis into the federal government if we use those to meet the essentials then it doesn't have to result in the shutdown and how do you think what do you think should happen to some of these um, uh, representatives who were brought in at, you know as a Tea Party candidates who are actually going along with the compromise I mean what do you think is going to happen to them back in their district to tell you the truth, I think it's a shame that there's already some Tea Party candidates, some, some freshmen in there who believe that status quo is the only way to operate in D.C. You know, they got to remember that we work so extremely hard to hire them to do what is right for the American electorate. So they need to stand strong. They need to have those still spines and just use that common sense. And, and fiscal conservative um, uh, issues need to be played out in, in their budgeting process. And, and not compromise. Uh, there's no need to compromise on principle. We have no choice, Judge. We have right. absolutely no choice. Our nation is heading towards bankruptcy, and this is immoral, it's unethical, it's unfair to future generations to continue down the road we're going. And, you know, talking about bankruptcy and talking about money, there are many in the Tea Party, Governor, including Rand Paul, who are against foreign aid or international aid, including the money that we give to Israel. Where, where do you stand on this? 
you know, I'm sure that there is some waste and fraud in foreign aid and we need to find efficiencies and not give to any regime that would um, seek to harm uh, Americans in, in any sense uh, of the word uh, harm. I, I don't support that kind of foreign aid at all. But when it comes to Israel, no, I stand strong with Israel and unapologetically I say that uh, America should keep the strong democratic ally that we have there in the Middle East and, and allow for protections around Israel. Think of what this state, Israel, has gone through and um, what they have suffered through and what they have triumphed over. It's, it uh, is real telling about their tenacity and their character and it's just one reason that character as to why it is that we want them as our friend. And you know what, what's interesting about uh, Israel, and, and I've been there several times, is you know you see the young women who are in the military, who are in combat, and uh, you know you are energized at their enthusiasm and their love for their country. But you know, uh, talking about money going to other countries, and I'll bet so many Americans have no idea how much foreign aid we give to other countries. Mexican President Calderon was in our country this week and it seemed as though he was chastising us again uh, about the problems at the border and yet President Obama seemed to be uh, saying that he has shown extraordinary courage uh, in the uh, drug war in Mexico. Uh, first of all, do you think that he has and secondly, what do you make of the president, you know, being so complimentary of Calderon who comes here to chastise us every chance he gets? Yeah, and this is at least two times now that the Mexican president has come here to chastise Americans, and we just kind of, it seems like our leaders kowtow to him and allow him to uh, speak to the Americans as, as he does, when I think he's quite off base in, in terms of uh, America's courage and our desire to have a robust economy and to have a safe and secure homeland, and that's why we want to secure the borders, and that's why we want to encourage that president to start doing some things right in his country, including cracking down down on the drug lords and doing things to create jobs and opportunities in his own country so that it, illegal immigrants won't be enticed to come over the border illegally into America and try to seize opportunities that we would provide. Of course, you know, the legal immigration, that, that's a whole different story, but it, it amazes me that our president kind of seems to kowtow in this situation as he does in so many situations when it comes to foreign policy to the Mexican president. You know, and I, and I wish we had more time to talk about it, but certainly the whole issue of customs agents, you know, in, in northern Mexico, and, and we just had one who was recently shot, and the fact that they can't carry weapons there, I mean, it's got to be so frustrating for the families. But I want to move on to the two American airmen who were shot dead in Germany this week. Here's a, uh, a, a sound of P.J. Crowley speaking for the Obama administration. Take a listen. We are looking into the individual uh, who shot our service members. We're looking into his relationship with others. I don't know that we've made a judgment yet uh, on, uh, on whether it was uh, uh, someone acting alone or somebody acting uh, in concert with others. So yeah, was, you know, for example, was the, was the shooting of, uh, of Congresswoman Gabby Giffords uh, a terrorist attack? I mean, you, you have to the look at the you have to look at the evidence and look at the motivation, then you make a judgment. All right, Governor, there you have it. They absolutely refuse to call this terrorism, even though the shooter shoots two uh, airmen on a military bus yelling Allah uh, Akbar. And why is right. he so afraid? Why is the administration? administration so afraid to admit that this is terrorism? Why is the administration so naive and assuming that the American public is going to accept a comment like PJ's that essentially equates a crazed maniac in Arizona shooting Gabby Giffords to this terrorist who tried to and was successful in gunning down our servicemen overseas as he did yell out al Akbar. This is, to me, um, I think reflective of remember the incident at Fort Hood where it took weeks and weeks and weeks for but the Obama Governor, administration to finally admit that there was a terrorist but, involved but why there. why do you think, Governor, he's afraid to call it terrorism? I don't understand why the reluctance to be objective about what's, com what's going on. His worldview, our president's worldview, certainly seems a bit um, different than I believe than most Americans. Because, Judge, I think if you asked most Americans on the street, if, if 
Okay. Someone was hell bent on yeah. killing one of our military mm -hmm. personnel, yelling Allah Akbar, yeah. and had uh, terrorist ties. If you can't see that clearly as a terrorist, then um, we've got some things quite askew in our administration. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, all right, Governor. The summer is uh, not that far away from us, and it seems like those oil prices are spark uh, spiking, and the gas is going up every day. What do you think the government should do about these rising prices? Should they start uh, tapping into the strategic oil reserves? Well, that's not the solution. The solution is to drill here and drill now. And the Obama anti-oil agenda has got to be stopped now. He needs to realize that back in 08, our U.S. crude also was traded at about $100 a barrel, as it is today, for about six months. And that was right before our world economy imploded. And now here we are back again. So his timing, his destructive timing of locking up 97% of our offshore and not allowing Anwar to be touched, not allowing domestic drilling to take place to the degree that it should, it is terrifying where he is leading us in terms of being at the mercy of foreign regimes that would seek our demise to produce energy for us. And of course, your response to that is to, I guess, drill, baby drill? It is. It's drill, baby, drill, because we have these God-given resources here, and we have the manpower, and we have the ingenuity to be energy independent. Right above our Arctic Circle, we have 90 billion barrels of technically recoverable oil. We have That's hundreds amazing. of trillions of cubic feet of clean, green, natural gas. God has provided these for us. It's our responsibility to, resp to responsibly tap into them and use them for mankind and not rely on foreign regimes to do it for us. And, you know, speaking of the oil crisis, I mean, do you think that President Obama should send troops into Libya or at least make it a no-fly zone? Certainly a no-fly zone. You know, I hate to say, you know, geez, more troops on the ground, you know, send more of our brave young men and women over there in Libya. When, yes, 41 years of Gaddafi, he's got to go. I think what was unfortunate there in Libya was that it took our administration so long to finally have any kind of full-throated support for ousting Gaddafi. We finally saw the writing on the wall, but what we should have done, instead of being hesitant that perhaps he would harm the American citizens who are over there, we should have told him, warned him through strong verbiage. We should have said, Gaddafi, if you touch a hair on one American citizen's head. We're going to hit you. We're going to hit you hard, and you're not going to be left standing. Instead, we are kind of hesitant, kind of dithering, vacillating on our position, it seemed, and that leads to kind of a, a perception of weakness around the globe. Well, I wish that we would have been stronger there well, with um, our language about Libya, and now that and now actions have to follow the language that President Obama finally did articulate. Well, you know what, Governor? Given that as soon as Mubarak made a press conference in Egypt, the president came out and said something. He couldn't wait to get out there. Why do you think he's so hesitant in Libya? Why did it take him 10 days to come out and, and take the stance of the pro-democracy uh, uh, demonstrators? Why was he so hesitant back with the Green Movement in um, Iran when um, freedom fighters wanted to oust Ahmadinejad and, and our president didn't want to really participate there with the language at least that should have showed the support for ousting um, a dictator, ousting an oppressor. Uh, it, it, it's tough to pinpoint exactly why it is that President Obama, it, in this case, what we're talking about right now with national security, he would seek to oust a, at least a quasi-ally in Mubarak, who had been by our side for those 30 years, quick to oust him, but quite hesitant on Gaddafi, on Ahmadinejad. That scares me. Now, rumors are that Kathy Griffin is going to play a Sarah Palin a Tea Party type on Glee. Uh, what do you make of that? Uh, she hasn't been kind to you or your family. Uh, what do you think? You know, Kathy Griffin can do anything to me or say anything about me because, you know, she's kind of this, she's a 50-year-old adult bully, really, is what she is, kind of a has-been comedian, and, and she could do those things to me. I would just uh, ask, you know, for respect to my children, as, as she had stated on CNN that her New Year's resolution was to destroy my 16-year-old daughter. That takes it a little bit too far. Kathy. Pick on me. Come up to Alaska and pick on me, but leave my kids alone. Well, uh, we're all with you on that one, Governor. One last question, and this is a fun question. All women love shoes, including me. Now, the last time I think you were in New York, you had on a pair of, and I think we have them here, a pair, a picture of some fancy shoes. I think they're leopard print shoes. Uh, and uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Can you see them? 
Yeah, I see them. Yep. You kind remember those shoes. So here's the question. You don't go fishing in those shoes. <laughs> Do you? No, I'm, no. In fact, those are Bristol shoes. Anything cool oh. that I have is uh, <laughs> usually a, a, a borrowed item from Bristol. All right. Well, I just wanted to say they were great shoes, and we all love them. Women love shoes. Governor, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. Take care. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Thank you. All right. Up next, a man in this country illegally brutally beats a young disabled boy to death. So why is he out of prison, walking free? We take a closer look at Justice Denied. He's on a drug and it's called Charlie Sheen. What's really behind all the rants, ravings, and radical one-liners? Geraldo investigates the actor's outrageous antics tonight. Matt McClellan wasn't exactly an overweight doughboy, despite twirling, slicing, and serving up pizza for a living. Spinach, tomato, mushrooms. But a fire burned inside him, hotter than his.